Hey friends, Michael Kingswood back at you again. It's story time. Recording this on Sunday, April 15th, 2018. It's tax day here in the States, but I don't care because I got all my stuff done a couple months ago. Hope you guys aren't stressing it too hard. By the time this comes out tomorrow morning on Monday, uh, you guys will figure it out one way or the other. But, no, it's a great day for everyone. Or not. But hey, this will make your week a little bit nicer. Again, you didn't know the story. Uh, this one, I've decided this week I'm going to do another one of my Larian stories. Larian, as you know, uh, started off in How Not to Rescue a Damsel in Distress when he tried to rescue his girl from brigands and didn't quite go as planned. And then uh, Measuring Up, which was sort of like a chapter one of his life in, in his army camp. And now First Blood. And now he's not going to run off to a... Uh, the town in the Rockies and get harassed by the police chief and crack and go off on some vigilante hunt in the woods until his colonel comes to, to uh, talk him down. No, it's just me, him with his scout unit on their first on his first real mission with them. Uh, so this one's shorter than last week's. Last week took about an hour. This is about a four thousand word story or so, if I recall correctly. So it'll be yeah, twenty between twenty and thirty minutes, and we'll come back and talk about it after that. Hope you guys enjoy. See you in a little bit. We'll get started. All right, let's go. First Blood by me. The sound of a morning dove pierced the silence of the woods, making Larian smile slightly. He always loved birds, their colors, their songs, their grace and flight. For a short time, he let his thoughts wander and considered how wondrous it would be to soar through the sky as they did. Such joy they must feel. Elisir. Sergeant Mansfeld's harsh whisper brought Larian back to the present. He started slightly and glanced aside toward the sergeant, wincing apologetically. The sergeant scowled and pointed his first two fingers at his eyes, then toward the area to Larian's right. Larian followed the sergeant's fingers with his gaze and cursed under his breath. The two men were perched in a tree at the edge of a clearing twenty feet up. Above their thick leather armor, they wore cloaks patterned in grays, browns, and greens to blend in with the natural surroundings. The sergeant had chosen their position with care. It offered clear views in three directions. Any of the enemy who came through would be easy to spot. Which is why Larian should have been the first to see the troop marching through the clearing to his right. If he had not been daydreaming, that is. He shook his head in chagrin, cursing himself for his inventiveness. Then he nodded and began counting. Twenty. Fifteen. A hundred. A hundred fifty. A full company and more passed their tree, not a hundred feet distant. He glanced at the sergeant as the enemy's force's rear guard vanished into the woods behind them. The grizzled warrior rolled his eyes and pointed at himself, then the limb below, where their caged pigeons sat. Then he pointed at Larian and made a writing gesture. Larian nodded and pulled a piece of charcoal and a paper from his tool pouch. The sergeant slipped down to the pigeon cage and Larian began writing. He still felt uncertain with the scout's cipher, despite weeks of practice every day. All the same, he got details of what they saw written down quickly enough. By the time the sergeant returned, pigeon clutched tightly in his hand, Larian finished reading through what he had written. He nodded in satisfaction and showed it to the sergeant. The older man's eyes scanned the page briefly, then he nodded, smiling ever so slightly in approval. A minute later, the sergeant released the pigeon. The report carefully rolled up into a case around its neck. The bird flapped its wings and quickly gained altitude, then turned and headed away from the two men, and so to the left. Back in that direction, several miles away, fifteen, maybe twenty, lay their regiment's forward encampment. Larian's platoon, the scout's B Company, had departed base camp two weeks earlier. Commander had received word through intelligence that the Marzaban were planning a raid through the regiment's assigned territory and ordered the scouts to investigate. They had found enough hints to make the commander put the regiment on alert, but nothing definitive. Three days ago, he sent the scouts out again. This was the first real contact with the enemy, besides signs and rumor. Larian felt a rush of excitement, coupled with the tingling in his limbs as adrenaline took hold. He tried not to remember that just a moment ago he had nearly wet himself when he first saw the enemy soldiers marching in column. That was not the sort of thing a man did, and certainly not a certain soldier. Good thing he had managed to keep himself under control. He would never live that down. The two men waited for nearly an hour, but no more enemy troops came within observation of their position. Either there were no more, 
or the enemy commander had decided to divide his men up to make them harder to detect. Larian suspected the latter, but then, you're still very new to this, so what did he know? Finally, the sergeant cleared his throat, drawing Larian's attention to himself, then pointed down toward the ground. Larian looked up at the sun, now well past its zenith, and nodded. Moving quickly, but with care to avoid making too much noise, they descended from their perch to the ground below. Now what? Larian whispered. The sergeant looked around carefully, then leaning close. Now, he said in a whisper that barely carried Larian's ears despite the older man's proximity, we go to the rally point. Lieutenant will want to know about this. Larian nodded. The pigeons were trained to return to the coop at the regimental camp. The lieutenant would not receive the message that way. The sergeant gestured for Larian to follow and moved away at a quick but careful pace. The hardest part of keeping up with him was avoiding twigs, branches, bushes, and other objects that would make excessive sound and give away their position. Larian had been learning, but he was still new to this and found it difficult. The sergeant's gait, on the other hand, was apparently effortless. He moved through bush, through grass, and across stone with the same lack of sound, hardly leaving a trace of his passage at all. Which was, Larian supposed, the reason he still found himself teamed up with the sergeant more often than not. The most experienced enlisted armsman in the platoon, the sergeant made it his business to make sure that everyone was up to snuff. Maybe because that was his job, Larian reminded himself whenever he got annoyed with the extra instruction. This day, though, Larian was not upset at being nurse-mated. Not anymore. The marts of Bond really were here, and suddenly the soldier act was no longer just an act. It was real and deadly serious. The rally point was next to a small outcropping of rock two miles distant from the clearing that Larian and Sargent had mistaken out. The lieutenant picked it because of its location, practically in the center of a small valley the scouts were checking this day, which made it relatively easy to find. It was not until he and the sergeant were drawing near to it that Larian realized that if they could find it easily, the enemy could as well. He drew up short, suddenly uncertain. The sergeant continued on several paces before he noticed that Larian had stopped. He turned and looked back at him, his expression questioning, then he crept back with an earshot of a low whisper. What's wrong, Elisir? Nothing, it's just... Larian paused, feeling foolish for some reason. He looked away from the sergeant's gaze and flushed. What? The sergeant's voice was insistent. How do we know the Martaban haven't found this place already? The sergeant's eyebrows lifted high on his head. Get a little jumpy, aren't you? He shook his head and grinned. This is our land. We know the terrain better than they. He clapped Larian lightly on the shoulder and gave it a quick squeeze. Come on. Larian grinned the return and, casting his doubts aside, followed the sergeant up to the rock. The rock jutted out from the side of a low hill near its crest. The trees thinned out around the rock, which looked almost like a single curved claw of some giant beast thrusting out of the earth. As the two men stepped into the clearing below it, Larian could see no other men around. We must be the first, the sergeant murmured. Then he whistled, his gruff voice mimicking a blue jay's call perfectly. After half a minute with no response, he tried again with the same result. Then he shrugged and stepped up toward the rock and removed his helmet. I guess we wait. A sudden movement in the undergrowth to the left, beyond the sergeant's shoulder, drew Larian's attention. His eyes widened as he saw a figure in browns and greens level a bow and draw back on the string. Down! Larian cried and threw himself atop the sergeant. Bearing him to the ground at the same time, the archer released the bowstring with a sharp twang. The two men hit the ground, the wind leaving the sergeant's lungs in a loud exhalation. Larian cringed as the loosed arrow passed above them. He felt the movement of the air in its wake. It was so close. A curse from the archer's direction reminded Larian that this was no time to cower. He rolled off the sergeant, then sprang to his feet and drew his sword in one smooth motion. And he was greeted by two men in dark leather armor wearing cloaks of green and brown that were cut in an unfamiliar, foreign manner. They advanced from the vicinity of the archer's location. Larian did not need to see their bared blades to know they were the enemy. The pair paused for a moment, looking at Larian warily as though surprised or intimidated. Larian scoffed inwardly. Intimidated? By what, by him? <laughs> that was to laugh. By the time the thoughts flashed through Larian's mind, the two men overcame whatever it was that had stopped them. They glanced at each other in advance, moving apart as they came, so that they would be at his flanks by the time they closed the distance. Behind him, Larian heard the sergeant trying to rise, but he was gasping loudly as he struggled to regain his breath. He would not be ready to fight for a few moments. Larian would have to face two men on his own for now, and the archer, wherever he was, 
Larry and Sparrow had glanced toward the area where he last stood, but could see no sign. The two swordsmen came closer. Larian licked his lips and fought to suppress a surge of fear. His mouth went dry, and he could hear his heart pounding in his ears. A loud voice within him screamed, Run! He's been more experienced than you. You're a dead man if you stay. He tried to tell the voice to shut up, but it just shouted all the louder. Larian backed up a half step. The swordsman, to his right, grinned, a malicious smile of triumph, as the other man perceived Larian's fear. It was the man to his left, though, who came first. Without even a whisper of a battle cry, the man raised his sword in advance, cutting downward and to left toward the back of Larian's neck. Larian moved without thinking, months of training spurring his muscles into motion despite his continuing doubt. He leapt to his left and swung his sword. His blade met the attackers with a clang, but he did not stop there. He pivoted around his forward foot and spun completely, his left elbow leading the way as he landed on his attacker's left side. Larian heard as much as felt when his elbow connected with the side of the man's face. He let out a groan of surprise and pain in time with a crunching sound as either the bone of his cheek or several teeth broke. Larian continued to spin, letting his momentum carry him behind the man. He landed on his right foot and turned to face the man's back, bringing his blade down at a descending arc. The man let out another cry, this one high-pitched, as Larian's sword cut through his left boot and into the meat of his calf. He fell to the ground, clutching at his wounds and thrashing around in pain. Larian came to a halt, amazed at what had just happened. He glanced down at the fallen man, then up at his sword, now stained red on the last few inches of his blade. A small drop of blood pooled and fell from the tip, and Larian swallowed again. The second swordsman paused as well, his eyes growing wide with what Larian could only hope was fear. Then the other man took a breath and his eyes narrowed. He advanced, more slowly this time. Larian rolled his shoulders to loosen them and laid his left hand below his right on the hand and a half hilt of his sword. Then, stepping carefully to give the fallen man a wide berth, he moved forward to meet the oncoming swordsman. The enemy came forward with a quick, controlled steps. His attack was a measured thrust, not the all-out all -out approach his fellow had taken, which Larian was able to sidestep with ease. It flashed through Larian's mind that it could not be this easy as it cut downward at the man's neck, where it met his shoulder. He gritted his teeth in anticipation of the impact. But his attack never landed. The man recovered from his thrust faster than Larian would have thought possible and brought his blade up across his body to deflect Larian's cut off to the side. Larian lurched forward, thrown off balance by an unexpected parry. He could not afford to fall, but it seemed inevitable, so he pushed himself forward, hitting the ground and rolling over his shoulders before springing back to his feet. He felt as much as heard the man approaching from behind. He was right-handed, so he'd probably cut from that side, Flashing back to his time in the ring with Giles, Larian leapt to his right and spun to face his opponent. Sure enough, the man's swords swept through the empty air where Larian's back used to be, and it was his turn to stumble forward. Larian moved without thought, stepping forward and thrusting his blade into the man's armpit. The sword slid in far more easily than Larian would have expected. The man stiffened, his eyes widening in shock and sudden pain, then let out a long, gurgling groan. The sword fell from his hand, landing on the rocky ground with a metallic clank. The man turned his head and looked Larian in the eye. His gaze was not hate-filled, as Larian would have expected in form of the Martaba, and instead, it was almost warm. The corners of the man's mouth turned upward slightly, and his lips parted as if to say something. Then his eyes went vacant, losing their focus, and he slipped forward limply. The body slid off Larian's blade and landed on the ground with a soft thud. A harsh cry to his right brought Larian spinning around, his sword raised to on guard, and he saw the archer stumble into the clearing from behind a tree. He grasped at his belly, which was cut open from hip to hip, trying in vain to keep his innards from still filling out. His stumbling feet caught on a rock, and he fell to the ground face first. "'You'll be done in a minute,' said the sergeant, as he stepped into view from behind the same tree. He wiped blood from the steel of his blade and looked from Larian to the two downed swordsmen. Is that one going to live? He pointed to the first man Larian had felled. Larian nodded. Got him in the legs all. Excellent. Sergeant sheathed the sword and strode over to the stricken man, a grimly satisfied expression on his face. Prisoners are always... He broke off suddenly, cocking his head to the side. What? Sergeant put one finger to his lips, then ducked behind the rock outcropping, gesturing for Larian to do as well. Larian joined him there, and they waited. It was all he could do not to rush out to meet whatever the sergeant had worried straight on. He tingled all over and felt supercharged. 
A small voice in the back of his head whispered that it was just battle high and he needed to remain calm and still. But oh, it was difficult. He just wanted to run and smite something. Seconds passed like hours, with Larian wondering how much longer he could stand to wait. Then, with a series of quiet rustles, a quartet of men in cowled gray cloaks of gray, brown, and green bolted from the trees on either side of the clearing, bared weapons gleaming in the afternoon sunlight. The tension in the sergeant's shoulders slid away, and he exhaled softly. Glancing at Larian, he shook his head in relief, Larian thought, then stepped around the rock into the open. Ho oh, there, Lieutenant, called the sergeant. The four men spun in unison, their cloaks flowing around them like fans as they turned toward the sergeant and raised their weapons. Then, just as quickly, they lowered them and relaxed. The men pushed back their cowls, revealing familiar faces. The man in the middle, shorter than the others by a hand, had a rugged face framed with black hair. His left eye was covered by an eye patch and a puckered score. A scar ran down that same cheek. Lieutenant Pallock nodded to the sergeant, then to Larian as he too stepped into view. Gesturing at the fallen men, he raised an eyebrow. He heard sounds of a fight. Glad to see you had things in hand. The sergeant shrugged. Elliser did most of the damage, sir. They related what had occurred and walked over to the wounded man, who by then had stopped thrashing and looked at the assembled scouts of the defiance, based heavily with fear. Scouts, from the look of them, had the same idea as we did, I suppose. The lieutenant nodded, then gestured to the sergeant and the two men at his side. Set up a perimeter. We don't want to get caught by a surprise. They nodded and found out into the woods. Faint sounds carried to Larian's ears as they took perches in trees around the clearing. Get that man ready to travel, the lieutenant said to Larian and the other man in the clearing, Larian's tent mate Giles. You two are bringing him back to base. Command's going to want to talk to him. Over the next several minutes, Larian and Giles first disarmed and then searched and tied up the wounded Martaban scout. Once certain he was no longer a threat, they cleaned and bound the cut to his calf and helped him to his feet. Giles found a good-sized stick that could pass for a crutch. After a brief discussion, they decided to modify his bonds so he could use the crutch to walk. Then they tied his left hand to the haft of the crutch and fashioned the lasso around the end of it to keep it tucked into his shoulder. His right hand they tied behind his back by itself. Possibly he could take a swing at one of them with the crutch, but then what would that gain him? Larian would not try that if he were in the fellow's position, and he doubted the prisoner would either. By the time they had the man ready to go, the rest of the scouts from Larian's platoon arrived at the rock outcropping. The lieutenant filled them in on what had happened there, and they all compared notes of what they'd seen that day. It all added up to a sizable march of bound force, at least four companies of soldiers, but probably more. Larian had to fight down a surge of anxiety as they tallied up the numbers. Their own regiment only consisted of four companies, and being outnumbered was never a good position to be in. Then it was time for Larian and Giles to get going with their prisoner. The others in the platoon clapped them on their shoulders and wished them luck, then stepped back so the lieutenant could have a say. Move quickly. Don't stop for the night. Drop them off as soon as you can, then get back out here. He paused and took a breath. Above all, be safe. Good luck. They followed the lieutenant's orders to the letter, not stopping at all except for very brief meals and for the call of nature. It was slow going with the prisoner, and at every turn, Larian half expected to run into a column of Martaban soldiers. But whether by luck or through Deus's goodwill, they encountered no one until mid-morning the next day, when they came upon the outer pickets from regimental headquarters. As they passed the pickets by and walked the last mile to the camp, Larian felt a large tension that he had not even realized he was carrying fall away. Later on that day, he'd likely be out again, and in danger. But he had met the enemy in combat for the first time and came out, not just alive, but victorious, and for now, at least, he was safe. It had been a pretty good day. Okay, so the story took 17 minutes to read, not 20 or 30. I stand corrected. So yeah, that's the third of Larian's stories. Again, as with, as I keep saying this a lot, I haven't read it in a while. Uh, it's been, I think I wrote this in 2012. Yeah, it's been a while. So, uh... Looking back on it, I, I like this one. I like it a little more than the second one, Measuring Up. Yeah, Measuring Up is a scene setter. This one's a nice little, hey, quick little adventure for him. Hey, get in a fight, win. Get get some uh, get some info for the command. Hey, good deal. Um, now, let me, know, let me know what you think. It's, uh, as always, I'm always happy to hear what uh, your guys' opinions are. And... We'll go through how to talk to me about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I want to let you know the uh, other developments here going on. Um, 
you know, went through and listened to the uh, files for my audiobook of Glimmer Vale, my first of my Glimmer Vale Chronicles novels, uh, which is a sword and sorcery western kind of thing, uh, which I like a lot, and I'll, I'll be sharing that with you here shortly, um, next few weeks. So it'll be yeah, probably another week or two before I get everything squared away and uh, submitted to all the various sundry places like you know, Audible and the other spots you can get audiobooks. And then it'll take a couple weeks for them to publish them all. Um, so it'll be, you know, probably mid-May before it's fully out. Um, and we can figure it out from there. But I'm happy because this that one's been a little while in the in the in the making that audiobook. Uh, a couple of glitches occurred uh, and some scheduling issues, uh, but it's finally done. And now we're going to move on to the other uh, four books and one short story in that series, and uh, that'll be great. Hopefully, get all, those all out in the next few months while I'm still typing away on other stuff too. So that'll be good. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. So that's basically all that's new around here. Hope you've uh, enjoyed this little story. If you did, drop me a line. You can come to MikeKingswood.com and drop me an email through the contact form there. You can find me on the Facebook at uh, Facebook.com slash Michael.Kingswood. Uh, on Twitter, it's MichaelKingsWD. I'm, I'm almost never on Twitter because I hate it. I've always hated it. I had an account for a long time, but almost never use it. Uh, you can find me over on Steemit, the uh, crypto uh, blog slash social area. Uh, been a little sparse around there the last couple of months, just going to be doing other things. And uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of ways to contact me. Website's the easiest way. Uh, you can, uh, if you like the story, go pick up a copy. Right? Come by my web store at ssnstorytelling.com. And... Uh, I think this one is a little 99 cent deal, which if you got it through Amazon, get me, net me about 35 cents. If you go to my web store, I'll net me about 90. So, hey, better for me to go to my web store. And come by if you, uh, if you like my stuff, continue to subscribe to the podcast or the video channel, let everybody know about it. Um, and, you know, I appreciate it. If you really like my stuff, go over to Patreon, drop a buck or so every month. Or just leave some crypto tips on from my website or real money tips through PayPal. That works too. Um, yeah, that's basically what I got. I hope you guys had a good week. We'll uh, talk to you next time. Until then, don't do anything I wouldn't do.